Brian J.L. Glass's Dark Spaces Part 1, Stratton Dreams Book 1, Desolation's Tears Read by the author Chapter 15, Diversion 1. Merrin should have devoted his attention to how his initial assignment had ended in the murder of his contact. He would later blame the ghastly painting that hung in the late professor's office. Kokor. Later still, with eyes moist with tears, he would credit that same painting for helping him save lives he was yet to meet. But instead of exploring that mystery, he spent the remainder of his day at the Environmental Services Warehouse amongst the bizarre archives the former biologist had left behind, absorbing all he could about an obscure yet pervasive legend that seemingly permeated throughout the furthest reaches of every stratum, and yet one he had never encountered in all his 80 Stratton Standard years. There were no official accounts to substantiate any formal reports, reliable sightings, or tangible encounters. There were personal anecdotes, whisper-down-the-lane campfire tales, multi-generational ghost stories, but the mythology ran the gamut of biological and psychological nightmares. The Kokor grew from plants, from fungal spores, from contaminated water. They consumed humans from within, from something ingested. They arose from humanity's collective subconscious, manifesting from the dark spaces between the stars. The more unsettling tales were those which suggested they were humankind's own darkest selves brought to the surface to stand in judgment of the human race's sins. Dr. Havrel Sintel was able to connect strands between the less far-fetched lore and the current reported reality that had consumed Desolation Central occupied the law enforcement of redemption, and was no doubt already sending shockwaves up the strata to the many divisions and departments that made up ComFed itself. This Kakor was either some long-forgotten bioweapon, or might be something that could be wrangled into one. There would always be interested parties as long as there was a profit motive. The pair were so consumed cross-referencing the mythos with reality, they barely registered the passage of time, until Sintel's music paused to alert them to activity at the front door. Someone was trying to bypass the lock. 2. It was Dirk. He was on the other side of the door employing a device not as refined, yet still very similar to the override card Merrin had used earlier. Dirk was hunkered down to work on the lock as unobtrusively as possible, either against the elements or the random passage of pedestrians or law enforcement. But he looked up sheepishly as the door opened like a child caught in the act of doing something they knew was naughty. Sintel peered out cautiously and demanded, Who are you? What do you want? He had brought the crowbar with him. When Dirk failed to respond swiftly enough, Merrin filled the void with the stern voice of a master craftsman dealing with an unruly protege. His name is Dirk of the family Shodhelm, as I recall. Marin, Dirk gasped. Thank the Strata, it's you. He stood with a sense of urgency. You've got to get out of here. Sintel asked, You know this technician? Dirk still wore his sharp blue SEC coveralls and cap with the sewn-on earmuffs. 
Under the circumstances, the appearance had become comical. Merrin hastily explained. We crossed paths this morning. Get inside, he added as he grabbed Dirk's shoulder and pulled him through the open doorway. Sintel sealed and locked the door behind him. Merrin further added, I felt as if I owed him a bit of a debt, bequeathed some wisdom, and expected him to be on about his business by now. He glared. Dirk's exaggerated emotions were growing again, and Merrin sensed a building anxiety in him. I followed you, he declared. I spent the afternoon in a hotel. So did I! And the past several hours in here. Me too, Dirk blurted. Uh, only outside, across the street. Whatever for. I was worried about you. Merrin's action was swift, blocking one of Dirk's expressive arms up and away as he thrust his elbow toward the young man's throat. You're lying, Merrin declared bluntly. He'd stopped just short of actually striking the windpipe, and Dirk knew it. His eyes wide as he stared at the older man who would crush the breath out of him if he flinched. I'm lying, Dirk agreed. You got up from the tavern and, and you just left, he sputtered. I, I, I didn't know what to do, but I, I just knew I couldn't go back to what I was doing before. Merrin felt truth exude in waves. Something the young man was unaccustomed and uncomfortable with expressing. I followed you and I got a room just after you did, right next door. Dirk's lip began to quiver, and Merrin could feel him express an acute disappointment in himself that bordered on both a failure and betrayal of his core principles. Whatever conflict raged in the boy was profound. Merrin withdrew his elbow by millimeters. He asked, Then what have you been doing out there in the cold while I've been here? Waiting for you to come out, Dirk said. Trying to figure out what I was going to say. I, I, I didn't know. Sintel wasn't moved by anything he heard or saw. He raised the crowbar again and said, How do we know this isn't the guy who murdered Professor Strock? Dirk's eyes bulged wide again, his brow furrowing in a panic. What? No! I, I didn't kill anybody! Merrin felt Dirk's body tense for a reflexive action and reapplied his elbow's pressure to his throat. He's lying again, Merrin said, but with less concern but I find it very doubtful this boy is the assassin we fear. Dirk and Merrin locked eyes, and the young man looked genuinely lost. Merrin realized that taking a life was not something beyond Dirk's experience, and his guilt and anger, as well as the impact Merrin had made upon both facets, considering the circumstances under which they met, now made significantly more sense. Merrin lowered his elbow and unpinned Dirk's upraised arm. He sighed and said, So, have you come to any conclusion on what you were going to say once I discovered you were following me? I don't have a clue, Dirk said in a daze of post-adrenaline haze. But we're running out of time. You've got to get out of here. Sintel remained suspicious, but lowered the crowbar. Explain, Merrin demanded. Dirk fumbled in one of his pockets, and Merrin and Sintel tensed. Dirk froze, then slowly pulled a portable receiver from his coveralls. Unlike Merrin's device that had allowed him to decipher encrypted signals, this was a basic commercial model for public broadcasts, as well as a few governmental and flash shield communications. I've been listening to this most of the day, Dirk confessed. They declared a curfew a few hours ago. We know, Sintel said. Yes, 
added Merrin. As a city employee, Dr. Sintel was alerted and he informed me. I received it as an opportunity to stay put and continue my research, not be out in it defying the authorities. Dirk shook his head. You don't understand. With whatever it is that's roaming the city, Redemption doesn't have enough manpower to enforce the curfew. Both Merrin and Sintel failed to see the concern. Some local gangs have volunteered to supplement their forces. It's a corruption thing, but both the mayor and Desolation Central have agreed to an arrangement with the Golian Stratum's major underworld boss. Sintel interjected. Onath doesn't even operate from here. It's too cold. Merrin's impatience was growing. But what does any of this have to do with me? Onath has ordered his guys to come here, Dirk emphasized. I picked it up. They're being pretty open about it. Onath wants to question the planetary biologist about whatever's running loose on these streets. Sintel was exasperated. Professor Strzok is dead. But you're the new biologist, Merrin countered. I'm not even qualified, Sintel argued. They don't know that, Merrin concluded, with his own sense of urgency engaging. Dirk butted in. I actually saw them coming about two blocks away. Looked like maybe twenty of them. And they had frickin' torches! Merrin asked Sintel, Is there a back door? Yes, but it's blocked with shipping crates, Sintel said abruptly, revealing how out of his element he was living on such a backwater world where, although things could be serious and even deadly, nothing had ever actually been urgent before. Same with the underground tunnels. We typically don't use either access out of season. There's a warehouse gate, but that opens to the front, he offered, knowing it wasn't helpful. The rapping of a fist against the door rattled the three of them into silence as they backed away. The bell rang once, but then the lock blew inward from an old-fashioned but reliable shotgun blast. 3. The door burst open and four burly thugs entered, spreading out to surround the trio within. With the rest of the mob waiting outside, the ringleader entered with a humph. Which of you three is the comp-fed biologist, he demanded. Sintel cleared his throat and said, Professor Hakem Strock died yesterday. He was murdered. Nah. The ringleader grunted. Don't care about that. We want the new one. Merrin immediately sensed there was no underworld motive involved in Strock's death, or else this underling would have had at least a cursory knowledge that would have nuanced his delivery. He doesn't know anything, Merrin said, trying to both deflect and gain further knowledge himself. Who are you? the ringleader queried. Confed Insurance, Merrin quipped. Claims Assessor. And I fix stuff for SEC, Dirk added quickly. That's Stratton Elite Communications. He nodded his head sharply to indicate the cap he wore. Shut up, the ringleader ordered. Another thug from the mob waiting outside came in with a compad, showed it to the ringleader, and pointed to Sintel. After a few whispered words between them, the ringleader told the mob, We'll take all three. Let Onath sort it out. He knows what he's looking for. As the encircling thugs advanced, Merrin saw Dirk shift into a defensive stance, preparing for an action that would be disastrous for them all. It's all right, Dirk, Merrin assured. Just follow my lead. Dirk seemed genuinely surprised when Merrin extended his arms, hands out, palms downward. One thug approached with a plastic strip to bind them. Patience, Merrin added. 
A beginning is not the end. Dirk looked like he disagreed, but he still followed Meryn's lead and allowed himself to be bound as well. Sintel was disarmed of his crowbar, and he followed Dirk into detention. The two following Meryn as the elder man took the lead in their captivity. As they all shuffled outside, the ringleader announced, Just one more stop, then we can all get back inside. They were headed for the hangar district. As a group, they never made it. This has been Brian J.L. Glass's Dark Spaces, Book One, Desolation's Tears, read by the author. Audio and video production by A.J. Blackburn. Original music composed and performed by Frankie Caffrey. Brian J.L. Glass's Dark Spaces and B.J.L.G.'s Dark Spaces are copyright. 2022 by Brian J.L. Glass.